So when you're looking at the screen, you're probably going, this doesn't look like a normal corporate webinar. Like, aren't these supposed to start with flashy overdone graphics and things like that? Instead, we're seeing Fred's GitHub repo. That's really exciting, Fred. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the exciting effort in marketing graphics today. Um, but, but it's indicative of this session, right? And I, I want to spend just a minute in the, the opening monologue here talking about uh, how Fred and I came up with the idea for this session. So if you remember back a couple months ago when Fred and I first talked about the network operations maturity model and how, you know, we can advance our organization's um, capabilities further and further to the right by increasing the amount of automation. And to increase the amount of automation, we have to start with repeatable design patterns, consistency in architecture, because otherwise that enables automation to scale. And then we talked about the pain point that, uh, you know, where bluntly the mistake that, that I, I had personally made where I was like, let's go do full autonomous stuff. Let's do predictive analytics. And a lot of people were like, can I just back up my configs, man? That'll make a huge difference. <laughs> you know, like, so what were the non-destructive, low risk, valuable, easy to implement type of programs, uh, projects, development efforts that we could put forward that would make a material difference in our environments? And so Fred, that his credit came up with a few and said, here they are, knock yourselves out. So I, um, I decided to try one and uh, I failed. I literally couldn't get Fred's backup working. And it's not Fred's fault, it's mine. I'm an idiot. Um, it's hard to get a Python program running when you didn't install Python on your Mac. Lesson learned. Because <laughs> yeah, I needed Python 3 and I had Python 2.7 on by default. You, know, you get it, right? That, that's the issue. And at the exact same time, I was watching um, photography videos because I got a new camera and it was, it's cool. It's like here in my camera bag, Ta -da, virtual backgrounds for the win. And I got a new camera and I was watching these videos from this guy, Mark Gaylor, who did a really good job on it. And Mark was like, he had a whole section, what's in his bag, right? So I got this new A7R Mark IV and I wanted to learn what Mark had in his bag. And I went through the whole video and it's like, oh, I, I, I need to get one of those. Oh, I gotta get that thing. That's a great idea. And of course, like, yeah, I need that other lens too, right? <laughs> Things you never wanna actually, uh, you know, a surefire way to spend a few hundred dollars is watch a video of somebody else's photography and what's in their bag and you're, it's like instant cash burn. So I went through the what's in your bag video and I loved it. It was a great concept. And it made me ask Fred, Fred, what's in your bag? What do you do on your laptop? How did you set up your development environment so that you could be successful implementing one of these projects? Like how do I install Python and Git and VS Code and Ansible? and all of the other capabilities that Fred needs to install into his system so that when he does get clone a project, he can actually do something with it pretty immediately. And, and I, I'll give a, a shout out to my, my friend, Nils Swart. I, I probably the other impetus of this is, is because my buddy Nils, I had a, uh, Nils and I were hanging out one weekend and he got to watch me rebuilding a gaming rig which is like something we do every year if you've built your own computer for gaming. At least once a year, you blow it out and you start from scratch because all of a sudden everything's faster and you get rid of all the crufty buildup of, you know, little DLLs and stuff that scatter everywhere. And Nils like, dude, why don't you use Vagrant and VirtualBox? It's so much easier. Use a composable environment. I'm like, oh, that's a neat idea. Let me try it. Wow, that made my life better. And it was just as dawning that there are so many tools out there and some are really good. And they can make our lives a lot better if we know about them, we know how to use them. And one of the most useful things is when you're sitting at a hackathon, it's not just you sitting there writing your own code for the next eight hours of you know, Mountain Dew or espresso fueled awesomeness, this is number five. It's talking to the guy next to you going, how did you do that? Oh wait, Python returns a non-ordered list and my, my list is gonna be different every time. So I need to copy it into an array and then do the sort. Oh, okay, got it, I can do that. Right, it, it's those things. And that's what we wanted to do is in this time of you know, environments, the environment we're operating in of a little less social interaction, a little less reaching over to the guy next to you at the hackathon. I wanted to tap Fred's brain 
for the better part of 30 minutes or so. And let's go through, Fred, what's in your bag? <laughs> what's in your bag, dude? You know, it's like, anyway, <laughs> what stickers are on your laptop? What are you running? If I'm starting from a zeroed out laptop or desktop or virtual box instance, what do I load? What should I load first? What are the things that are gonna make my life easier? Let's, let's go through some of these. Sure, yeah, it was actually kind of a fun exercise because you know, I think we all have our laptops. We've all added things to them over time. So kind of taking my brain and thinking back, oh, well, if I were to build this guy from scratch, what, what are the key things that I need to do? Kind of what order of operations would I wanna do? Because some things I want you know, to have in order to do other things. Um, so, so that is part of what this, uh, this repo screen you're looking at is, is a quick dump of, here's the things that I really gotta use uh, to get productive and get, and get operational from a new laptop. Uh, and you'll see that most of Are we gonna of get into a VI versus Emacs debate? Can we, uh, can we have one? VI all the way, come on, there's no question. <laughs> Challenge. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and then we're gonna do spaces versus tabs too, but uh, yeah, so, so this is, this is definitely that. And this is, uh, this is all very Mac centric. Uh, I'll kind of give a heads up on that from the get go, just cause that's what I'm running all of my stuff on. But you can really do this stuff. A lot of these tools are, are pervasive across different platforms, right? So if you're on Linux, use your app or your yum or whatever your, your um, package manager is. If you're on Windows, I recently got back into the Windows world a little bit. I did not know there's a tool called Chocolatey that's kind of like, Brew for Mac, which is I totally awesome. Didn't know about this either. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so if you're loading up a new Windows box, uh, you've got some some help there. So it's a lot so, harder to spell than brew, though, Fred. It is. Well, you just do choco, choco, whatever. Whenever you oh, okay. actually do it. Yeah. And actually, I think I typoed it there anyway. So you're right. It is hard to spell. <laughs> uh, <laughs> So, so, so first off is kind of what we just, what we're touching on here is, is on a Mac, you really want homebrew, right? And, and what homebrew is a package manager for Mac. It's akin to apt or yum in the Linux world, if you're familiar with those. And what it is, is just a easy, sane way to install, upgrade, keep, keep up to date your software packages that you're installing on your Macintosh, right? So assuming you're gonna be working within the CLI a, a fair bit with a lot of these things, uh, you wanna install things like Python or things like Git, but you don't wanna to have to sit there and constantly maintain what version, upgrade these versions by going to the website, downloading the new binary, installing it on your laptop. You wanna have that- Brews like Windows package. Update Manager or when sort I get of, new yeah. software is ready to install Go. Yeah, yeah, as well as it's like partially the Windows Update Manager, partially the Windows App Store, right? So it lets me okay. very quickly find and install packages and then keep them up to date once they're there. Okay. Uh, Does so, it handle dependencies as well, like yes, and conflict resolution and stuff? Yeah, which is also a, a totally awesome <laughs> thing. Uh, you know, yeah, welcome no to kidding. the welcome to the 2000s or 2010s or whatever 2020s uh yeah so so rather than brew, having to brew where were you in 1993 when i was building gaming rigs to play doom right right, right. totally you would have saved my life i had ghost images and I, this is so much better okay right which again yeah great, great uh other point for brew and, and these package managers in general uh they they help resolve these dependencies so if i'm missing that c plus plus library to install xyz tool uh, go find it, install it for me because obviously I need it to, to make this stuff work. Yeah. That um, is awesome. So, yeah. So, so Bruce, and you I know, just run that first command. Thing you gotta go. Yeah. So this is it. Here's the website. If you want, if you don't trust my, my copy and pasting, but you know, here's the website, they'll give you the same exact command. You well, drop Fred, you can't spell chocolatey, window. right? I mean, <laughs> I <come> know. On. <laughs> so, uh, so you drop into a terminal shell or a tumor, terminal window, run that command and, uh, it'll do all the, the magic for you and install it. Um, you Super know, cool. people who are probably, you know, fairly security conscious will be a little bit wary of running a shell command off of just a random uh, GitHub URL. So, you know, satisfy your paranoia and you can go to the URL and make sure it's what you think it is before you install it. So, yeah, yeah. you're not going to roll that one back too easily, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So, so that's kind of first and foremost, let's get a package manager on your Mac. Again, if you're in the Linux world, you're, you're kind of golden from the get go. Um, the next thing I like to have is iTerm2, which is a replacement for the basic built-in uh, terminal that comes with a Mac. So 
you know, if you if you pop up your Windows or your Mac terminal, this is what you get out of the box when you have OS 10, right? So this is your your standard terminal. You've got mail. Well, yeah. So I just I, didn't, I, I had don't to. Even know, I had I don't to. Even know where that came from. But uh, but that's your um, MOTD is you've got mail. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even know that was there. But but look at iTerm. iTerm Tomb is just a much more pretty, much more feature rich terminal environment. Again, if the you magic think of back, tabs. <laughs> the magic of tabs. The magic of custom colors and custom you know graphics here you can see i'm looking at my cp utilization my github branch all these things all getting piled into my my uh, terminal window so oh. making things a lot a lot more user friendly or a lot more powerful from a customization standpoint which is what i term to is Would, uh, let me I, can i dive into this for a second so yeah you said the github branch and i let's hope that everybody's reasonably familiar with github but it's a central repo of open source software that you can clone and then compile and run on your machine. Um, but this iTerm is aware of your GitHub repo. And so if you're doing work here, you can directly commit it to a brand. What is yeah, the integration? So, so that's there anyway. I mean, that's just your command line, but what it's telling me is which branch of the code I'm on, I'm on right? So if I'm on, you know, if I'm working on the master branch, that's what's showing me here. Uh, if I'm working on some specific version of this code and I've branched off to do a bug fix or I've branched off to do a feature request, um, you know, as you get more sophisticated with your GitHub branching, you get lost as to where, where are you in your code, right? Yeah. And it's, you always want to know <laughs> where you're working from because you don't want to be working from a weird branch that you thought something was there, you go reworking stuff and then you break everything. You don't want to um, put it in the wrong place, yeah. You don't want to put it in the wrong place. You don't want to be starting from a place where you're not supposed to be starting from. Um, so yeah, this is a, just a nice little add-on you can do on, on iTerm, which says, hey, you're on the master branch. So you know you can very quickly and uh, easily identify exactly where you're on the branch. And uh, this little dot here also tells you whether you have code that you have uh, added to, the, to your current place and you haven't committed yet. Um, so you know whether you're working off of committed code or you're working off of uncommitted code. So, so what is the little, mouse emoji? Uh, this is just a little thing that's, uh, this is actually part of my CLI and we'll get into that in a bit. Okay. But this is just saying it's, it's via, via GitHub. That's a little emoji for, for GitHub here on this thing. Okay. Um, but yeah, so my, my, my command line prompt is also giving me similar information. Um, but yeah, iTerm2 is just a, a much nicer terminal, more feature rich terminal to work from uh, as opposed to the default Mac terminal. So, And, and just so noticing you have some telemetry on CPU and memory, uh, CPU and IO utilization. So this is if you accidentally start in one tab, some process running that's spiking the CPU, you could be aware of why it's causing a slowdown somewhere else. Yeah, it's keeping yeah, you exactly. kind of situationally aware. Yep, yep, exactly that. Plus it just looks pretty. Um, does who doesn't love a graph or a map <laughs> yeah and and it, it just also does a better job with colors because you know you want to do some color syntax highlighting and stuff when you're in your, cool. your text editor or whatever so it does a better job with all those things um so yeah so i really like to to have iterm on there um now kind of now there's a there's kind of two camps here as far as whether you want to just play around with tabs and iterm too or you want to use virtual uh, virtual screens in Tmux. Uh, I end up doing both depending on what, what I happen to be working on. Um, but Tmux is a way of having kind of multiple virtual terminals within your terminal environment. So you can see here I'm on the CLI and I'm working within uh, one of my tabs in iTerm. But if I go to Tmux, um, oops, it looks like Tmux is broken on my machine. So let's, let's, let's fix this real quick. Uh, Ladies and gentlemen, a real live demonstration of the power of brew coming right yeah. up. Well, yeah, I can do that. Let's do a brew update and a brew upgrade. So I'll do that. But while I'm waiting for that, just to, to not delay things, uh, here, here's Tmux running on, a, on another box uh, while I'm running brew in the background. And you can see that what it's going to do is allow me to have kind of like what I have with the multiple tabs. I can have multiple virtual terminals here. So you can see I've got two different bash windows here. So if I do an LS in this one and I pop over to the other one, I don't have LS running there. So this is just giving me multiple screens uh, to work with. So what, what I like to use this for is, let's say How I'm editing How are you switching code. screens? What were you oh, doing? Oh, sorry, yeah. So there's a bunch of hotkeys that you're gonna have to learn for Tmux, but everything here starts with, <sighs> I know. Everything here starts with a control B. So control B is kind of your leader into what I'm gonna wanna do. 
And so if I do a control B, uh, control B C, it creates. So C, I think of as for create uh, a new terminal. Oh, and that's what I see at the bottom. I see zero bash one bash two bash. Those are your virtual instances. Exactly. And then okay, if I do got it. Control B N, uh, to me that means next. So that'll just flip over to the next. That's N terminal. for intuitive. Yes. <laughs> So, so yeah, the entire job of the session is comic relief and making right. fun of people's selection of command line arguments. Okay. <laughs> so, so yeah, so this is letting me pop between these different terminal windows. Now, one of the nice things is I actually, I like, I, I, I really like Tmux for remote sessions, which is what I have here with my, one of my servers in the lab, because what I can do is I can disconnect from this session. Right. And then, uh, you know, if, if for whatever reason, let's say my, I, my VPN dropped and I, and I lost connection to this server, the TMUX session will stay open so that later on I can, I can uh, come back in. Oh. And, and if I can remember the, the command here, um, I, I can pop back into my TMUX and res resume work from where I was. So the sessions are persistent yes. even through some sort of connectivity disruption or I need to drop and go to dinner. And I'm going to come right. back and I can go right back where I was on a remote system. Exactly. So, oh, so that would have saved my I, bacon a few times. Even though I like Tmux here on my Mac, I, I actually really like it for my remote session work because that way I can kind of keep those sessions persistent. Like you're saying, I can drop out of them. I can leave them, come back to them and have everything right back to where I was. So if I'm in the middle of a troubleshooting session or a coding session. Now, I bring does it back. require anything to be installed on the far side? So yeah. So, so the, Right here, I have installing Tmux on my Mac, which is the brew install Tmux. Uh, if I'm working off of a Linux box remotely, I would have to install Tmux on the box that I'm on. So you'd run the yum repo for installing Tmux over there? Yeah, apt, okay. apt, apt git install Tmux or yum install Tmux, whatever it is. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would put that on the remotes uh, box as well. Super cool. Yep. So, so Tmux is a very handy tool, again, especially for remote sessions. Um, okay, so the next one up, Git. Do we uh, have we, T? Is is it? Po I'm yeah. so sorry. But no, 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 no. Is it possible to install Tmux on EOS? I didn't. I didn't want to make this session a super Arista centric one. I wanted to be a little more. But can I install Tmux on EOS? You could, because because you know the beauty of Arista EOS is it's based on a Linux distro. It's based on CentOS in in current versions. So yeah, you could yum install Tmux. Um, I think out of the box it comes with Screen, which is like the predecessor to Tmux, which totally does uh, similar things. It's just not quite as pretty. Um, so you could use screen out of the box and do a screen uh, session on EOS or Super. install Tmux using. Uh, oh, that's using awesome. That. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Um, all right. So next up is Git. You hear us talking about Git and GitHub and Git repos all the time, right? So this is a version control source code manager. So this is kind of the de facto these days when it comes to uh, version control of my, my code. And it doesn't even just have to be code. I mean, I use it here for this document. I'll use it for all kinds of stuff. It's just a nice handy way of being able to version your, your stuff and share it with others and be able to have people um, collaborate on different things. Uh, so yeah, you gotta just brew and install. I people Git. use it for meeting notes. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Um, it's just, it's really pervasive at this point. So. So brew install git and, and get the git command line uh, installed on your, on your machine. You'll see us uh, you know, use git in various flavors as we go down through some of these different applications. So you'll see git pop up here and there. Okay. Um, yep, so then Docker. I mean, Docker was, was oh, definitely me, the hot. Yep, yep, go ahead. J again, just kind of, some of this is hard for me because I, I've been, we've been doing this for a decade. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But on the flip side, I'm like, for somebody who's starting day one, if Git is a central repository in the cloud of documents like this and text and source code, then why do I need to install it? So what you do need... I get by ins uh, what am I doing when I install it? I don't yeah, understand. So yeah, so really what this is installing is a command line or like a command or binary onto your system that lets me interact with those repos that are sitting remotely. Got it. Right? So, you know, you could probably just go to the web page, download the tarball, put it on your system, but you're not going to have a clean way. And you could write to a bunch of APIs and do everything that this, this Git command line does. Um, it just does it all for you because no one would want to do that 
uh, <laughs> no one would want to work with all those APIs to commit and release code and Got branch it. code and do all that stuff. So yeah, so it's it, just a it, tool. It's the interface from my machine to the central cloud repository for cloning something, version controlling, or committing code back in. Yeah, as well as locally on my on my machine, right? That's one of the big things about Git is that I have my local copy. I'm committing code. I can keep committing code locally until I'm ready to push that up, uh, and then sync it up with the with the online repo. Awesome. So it's also working with with your local machine too. All right. So next up, Docker. Again, Docker was was kind of a, a big game changer when it came out, and is uh, kind of gotten pervasive now as a tool to use for containers. And you know, then people are gonna ask naturally, what is a container? So I like to think of containers uh, not as lightweight VMs, but more of sandbox processes, right? So, so let's say I have an environment that I wanna be able to recreate and I wanna be able to, to use it you know, on my laptop, I wanna be able to use it on my servers, I wanna be able to use this as a way to package things up and deploy them in a reproducible fashion. To your point earlier, you know, how do I rebuild things and how do I move things along without having to start from scratch every time? And that's kind of what, to me, Docker does, is it lets me build a reproducible environment, which we'll call a container, uh, package up all the dependencies, all of the things into that environment and be able to reproduce that in other places. Uh, and so, you know, Docker, unfortunately, we can't brew install Docker. So you go to the Docker website here and you download the, the Docker desktop or Mac, install it, and it puts everything on your system. And then you can start working with the Docker commands. And you should get this little, this fun little whale icon up here on the top of your screen. So, so again, this lets me package up my dependencies. Works really well for things like Python, where you end up in dependency hell often with, you know, various libraries at various versions and all kinds of craziness, which you actually see here in this picture below. Yeah. Thank um, you to our fan, our, our, we are obviously big fans of XKCD. Yeah. And uh, yet another example of them just <laughs> illuminating the, uh, the world we operate in. It's amazing. It's really amazing how, how well they do. Um, but yeah, so, so allows me to, to kind of take care of a lot of dependency. And again, to your uh, earlier thing about EOS, uh, we do support Docker on EOS as well. So if I'm writing some kind of networky script, so let's take this back to the net DevOps uh, person's mindset, right? If I'm writing some kind of network script that I wanna use on my EOS box, I could write it on my laptop here, I could package it up in a Docker container, and then I could push that container over to my switch and run it right on my switch without having to worry about what libraries got installed, what libraries uh, aren't installed, what versions of Python I'm running. All these things get all contained within that container so I don't have to go through that mess. Super um, cool. So yeah, it, it, it hit back to another level of abstraction or indirection. It allows code portability across platform and keeps all of its dependencies in that wrapper. Right. Right, because I mean, you could potentially shoot yourself in the foot by installing some wacky Python script on your, on your, let's say on your EOS switch, where you updated a library that you weren't supposed to update and it messed up something else, right? So, so playing around with the dependencies in a contained environment really can really be beneficial. All right, so along, again, to, to the point you made earlier, Python 3. So out of the box, I, I believe to still, I haven't bought a new Mac in a while, but I think Mac, Mac ships with Python 2.7 out of the box. Um, and so the rest of the world's kind of moved on to Python 3. Uh, everybody's moved on to Python 3 at this point. I believe Python 2.7 is somewhat deprecated. Um, and this, this diagram here. It's still here is, the default on some systems. <laughs> it is, it is. Uh, this diagram here I think is really great uh, that SKCD kind of captured the insanity of installing Python on a Mac uh, specifically because you can see all this stuff specific to the Mac here. And with I'm renaming my laptop Superfund right now. But <laughs> that's what you see me doing. I mean, that's a great name. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's pretty, it get, gets pretty gnarly pretty quickly. Uh, and so, so there's a few things you can do to, to try to address this, this craziness. Uh, one of the things I, I think people should be aware of, and especially for, for newcomers to Python who may not be aware of, uh, is PyENV and even PipENV. And what these are are ways of creating isolated Python environments, right? So sort of like the Docker thing we were talking about, 
But what this does is let me set up uh, for a specific directory. I can say, this is the Python version I'm running for this particular project. These are the particular Python libraries I'm running and what versions of those I'm running for the project and keep that isolated to that particular project. So if I go to another project and it needs a different flavor of Python or it needs a different version of a library, I can make that independent, uh, make them independent of each other. And what's even more important is we don't fork up the system so I don't go messing around with the libraries that are you know, native on the host system. Uh, so I don't break anything that might be required there. So it's a, just a nice way of kind of cleaning up this this insanity of Python dependencies and libraries and versions. And I've lived that a few times in recent weeks, by the way. So I can completely uh, the almost stunned silence you hear from me is, oh, yeah, that would have been easier. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah, so, so definitely highly recommend checking out PyENV as a way of, of making that Python installation sane and not mucking around with other Python installations. Um, and then PipENV is similar to Py, PyENV. And what PIP is, is kind of a package manager for Python. So we talked about Brew, we talked about Apt, we talked about Chocolatey. Those are package managers for your OS. PIP is the same thing, but for your Python libraries. So it lets me have a nice, easy way of finding, installing, and maintaining uh, libraries that I'm using in Python. And then pip env is a way of containerizing or, you know, packaging that up in a way that I know it's mind blowing. <laughs> <laughs> I know it gets, it gets gnarly, which is why I like go. So we'll, we'll get to that one later on, but uh, yeah, building static binaries is fun. I've been learning the joy um, of go modules on the side lately. So watch yeah, out. Yeah. So, so, the, so this is now I did for just kind of for uh, reference, I did put in the, the standard brew install version way of doing Python 3, right? So you can just install it on your, on your machine globally uh, with a brew install and that works just fine. And it's, it's probably a lot simpler to get your head around, um, but you eventually will probably bump into this, this massive craziness up here. And then you'll wanna go back and take a look at PyE and V and uh, related tools. Just to, to kind of explain one, one area, when you put the, under brew install Python three, I, I see you have two echo, you know, alias Python, you know, to a path, echo alias pip to a path. What does, what do those two lines do for me? Yeah, so, so again, as we mentioned out of the box, um, your Mac is gonna, if you type in Python on the command line, it's gonna default to Python 2.7. Yep. Even after you install Python three like this, it's gonna still default to Python 2.7. So what this is saying is if I type in Python on my command line, run Python three, um, <laughs> Step into the 90s, young man. <laughs> right, right. So, so yeah, just a simple alias command to to take you straight to Python 3. And then if you want to run Python 2.7, you just have to explicitly call Python 2.7. Got it. Okay. Yeah. So it, 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 it changes your defaults, resets your defaults to what you want them to be. Sort of, yeah. It's, it's more of a, we're just going to re rename what Python does to, to be Python okay. 3 instead of what, what the uh, system thinks it should be. Okay. Yep. Uh, all right. So then what, now we've got Python, you've got all this other good stuff installed, uh, including pip, which we, we kind of touched on there. With pip, I can install Ansible because Ansible is just a Python module at the end of the day. It's a bunch of Python code. And so you can just pip install Ansible and then you've got Ansible and all the DevOps stuff, you know, refer to previous webinars on, on all the glories of Ansible. Um, we do yeah. tend to rotate to Ansible anytime we are talking large scale, multi-vendor, repeatable pattern deployment. And if you come back to our first principles on networking, design for scale, use repeatable patterns, design for resiliency, expect things will fail, and, and you know, make decisions that enable automation in multi-vendor because I, I should always be designing for a multi-vendor environment. It's a necessary financial control. And so, you know, that's why you see us rotating to Ansible a lot. It's a great tool, works well with Arista, works well with many other vendors. And that's, that's a good thing for all of us. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it's pretty much become the de facto um, DevOps tool for, for networking. I mean, there's others out there and there's others that are, have their merits, uh, but we see Ansible far and away the most in the net, I mean, network space. It, it worked for Andrew Wiggins in the bugger war. So it, it works for all of us. <laughs> good good call, call back. Good Thank call you. Out. Good call out. 
<laughs> it's one of my favorite books, man. Uh, yeah. It was mandatory reading in Army ROTC in the 90s. Yeah, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> all right, VS Code. So Visual Studio Code uh, is kind of my, my current favorite text editor, I would say. Uh, I mean, I, I always have a soft spot, soft spot in my heart for VI and Vim. Uh, and that's what I default to when I'm like on a remote system or something. But, uh, you know, VS Code is, is a really fantastic uh, code editor that Microsoft has generously open sourced to, or, or made free to the community and does a fantastic job of keeping up to date, quite honestly. Yeah, you, you changed my life with VS Code, Fred. Um, I, I was not familiar until one day Fred's like, why are you doing this in like glorified notepad, Doug? <laughs> you know, you, notepad plus plus. <laughs> Doug, you ignorant dolt, you know I mean? And, uh, and I'm like, oh, what's this? And, I, and, and honestly, I was like uh, a Microsoft product for my Mac that I'd, I'd really use. Okay, sure. Okay, whatever, dude. I tried it out. I'm like, whoa, again, back to mind blown. And honestly, to me, it reset expectations on what we as networking professionals need to start expecting of us as vendors delivering for you, right? And, and a little bit of a soapbox for a second, but it's like, why is it that in VS Code, if I try to make a, a Python function call for something I, I don't have added at the top, it will automatically go back and import it. It just fixes it automatically. Like, why does... Why if I try to enter a CLI command on my switch that's wrong, the switch waits until I'm done with the command line and hit enter and then tells me I screwed it up? Why doesn't it tell me before I'm finished with the command line that there's like major errors in there and it doesn't know what the command is? That's what I love about VS Code is not only is it extremely intuitive when you load the Go library, when you load the Python library into it, it understands the code that you're writing so well that it eliminates a large number of the human errors before I even hit enter. And I thought that was just amazing. Yeah, it, it really does an amazing job. And you also got to think, you know, the, it's VS, it's Visual Studio Code, but you think back to the original Vis Visual Studio, uh, which Microsoft developed for .NET and all that stuff and continues to use. It's, it's, it's actually one of the better IDEs out there yeah. for that environment. And so they've taken, I mean, obviously you have a ton of learning from that and they've taken a lot of those principles, a lot of those cool features, and again, very generously thrown that into the open source VS Code product. And it, and yeah. it shows, it really yeah. shows. Uh, and it's, we'll show it's you a little bit changer. of VS Code. It's an absolute yeah. game changer. Yeah, and, and there was predecessors to it, you know, Sublime Text and Atom and all these other things that kind of led up to Visual VS Code. But I feel like Visual, VS Code is kind of the, the pinnacle of, of what all those things built up to. Um, and we'll show you some, some examples of VS Code in, in a little bit, I think, just to to give yeah, you a little please. flavor of it. But yeah, VS Code's a fantastic thing. What is JQ? Right. JQ. So if you're not familiar with JQ, it's I'm not basically... familiar with JQ. <laughs> it's, uh, I think it stands for JSON query. That's gonna be what I'm gonna go with. Uh, it's basically a command line tool that lets me parse and query uh, JSON right from the command line. Okay, so, so you know, you, uh, I think most people are familiar with cat, right? I can cat mm -hmm. a text file. It'll just dump out the text file to my screen. Um, now, what if I wanted to actually do something useful with that text file? Okay, maybe I'll, I'll do that cat and I'll pipe it to grep and I'll look for, you know, a specific string. So, you know, cat the file, pipe it to grep, and then look for the word Doug. And I can find the word Doug in the, in the file. Um, JQ takes that up, up a notch. And what it will do is similar to that cat to grep thing, but instead of grep, I can pipe it into JQ. And now I can issue queries based on the structured format of that Java, uh, JSON, uh, JSON file, right? So I have an example here. So if I do this, so I posted and, you know, by the way, all of this stuff is posted uh, on the GitHub page. So you're, everyone's welcome to, to go grab it. Uh, and play with it. So I posted this just up here on GitHub, which is a, uh, a JSON file that's an excerpt from Shover on uh, EAPI, right? So I did a Shover on EAPI, it gave me back all this, this fun JSON. And this is the, the JSON, you know, well formatted output. Marked up, yep. Yep. So, you know, like I said, I could grep this and I could say, find me version, right? 
And okay, sure, it binds me version and all this. But it's not very intelligent as far as, it doesn't understand the structure of that text that I'm looking at. It doesn't know that that's a JSON file. It's parsing it just like any old text. Sure. Right, so instead, I can use JQ. And what JQ does is I'll paste this in here and then we'll, we'll go over it. So, so here I'm saying JQ, uh, go to result, which is the first uh, key here in my JSON response. And that returns an array. So go to the zeroth item of that array, which is this guy. And then pull out the system MAC address field. Which I is love that you just use the word zeroth. Zeroth. <laughs> zeroth. That's a good word. I'm going to try to use that a few more times today. I've done this for the zeroth time today, honey. <laughs> you know. so, so essentially, it lets me parse this JSON information and get to exactly the piece of information I want and then returns the system MAC address. Right? So instead of just kind of blindly grepping for a text, I can actually take advantage of the fact that this is structured information coming out of uh, a JSON file and query the exact piece of information that I want. Yeah, and you get back exactly what you wanted as a string properly formatted, ready to be then used for whatever other transformation or putting it into a variable or using it however you want. Exactly, exactly. And then the, the, that's I cool. Mean, I like. I'm gonna. I'm gonna read. This is good. Thank you. Yeah. And this, <laughs> ladies is and gentlemen, this, this webinar is just for me. Thank you for participating. <laughs> <laughs> and and really, honestly, this is just touching this the surface of what JQ can do. It can you can muck around with this and have it spit out JSON as a result of these queries and format reformat things. You know, change around the arrays, create new JSON objects. Oh wow! Um, it's it's actually super powerful. Um, but you know, this is kind of the base base use case that I think of is, you know, just find me a specific piece of data out of my JSON file. Yeah, this, I mean, by the way, this is a transformative command in, in my limited world. <laughs> and I, I can't tell you how many times something comes back and I'm like, how do I parse that? You know, and it's like, oh, let me become the regex master. I will get the data out of this. <laughs> right. <laughs> this is so much better. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think you and I both have talked about this before. I love the pipe, uh, the pipe command in Unix, right? I oh, think that's just you, one of the most You live and die things. by it, man. <laughs> and it just, the composability that it brings you is amazing. And tools like JQ, I, I love because they take advantage of that fact. So I can, you know, cat a file, I can curl a file, I can do whatever, pipe it into JQ and then have it do something and then pipe that into something else and do something else. So I, I just love that, that composability. Uh, of the, of the Unix command line. It's not a fragile data migration pipeline at all, ladies and gentlemen, he's used the pipe command. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, have, have fun with that one. That's a, that's a good one to play with. Um, VirtualBox, uh, you know, there, there, you could also do- um, I'm a huge fan of the next two. Those again are just VirtualBox and Vagrant working together mm -hmm. is like colossally game changing for me with interacting with something I want to play with on Unix. Yep. I don't know that I'd ever, I do, I want to be, I'm going to put up front. I'm not a fan of this for doing things in production, but doing things on my environment that I want to interact with stuff and test and develop and play with a noodle and break. I want to break stuff. If I think I'm going to break stuff, this is a great way to protect myself when I think I'm going to break stuff, totally, <laughs> which means totally. I should do everything in Vagrant. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so VirtualBox is basically a VM hypervisor you can run on your laptop that's open source, or, or I should say, you know, free to download. Um, and you can run that and, and run VMs. Oracle acquired it and, and kept it available as open source or as freeware, right? Yeah, yep. So, so you know, great, great tool to be able to run VMs on your laptop or even on a server if you really wanted to. It, it's yeah. pretty capable. Um, so, so get VirtualBox because you're going to need to run VMs at some point. Um, and then Vagrant, to your, to your point, is uh, a way of making those VMs uh, reproducible in a, in a very structured fashion, right? So, so what you do in a Vagrant file is you basically outline exactly what the properties of that VM are going to be, down to, you know, what software do I want to install on it and, and everything else that I want to do to that VM. Uh, you define all of that in your Vagrant file, then you just do a Vagrant up, it'll contact VirtualBox in this case, and stand up the VM and do all the things that you told it to. And then if you blow that VM away, you need to make a new one, you just vagrant up again and you can reproduce that VM uh, ad nauseum. So Fred, yeah. I'm gonna ask you a question and 
probably posit a challenge to our audience then. Is it possible that somebody could take this amazing list of stuff you have here, right? Of which th this is the Mac version and I understand that, but if they were to do the CentOS version or the Ubuntu version of a lot of these tool sets, would it be possible to put up on Git the vagrant recipe for that VM that somebody could clone and then, or the virtual box recipe for it, they could clone it with Git, execute it on Vagrant and stand up that CentOS or Ubuntu local image through VirtualBox that had the properties of having had these packages installed into that Linux, into that Linux environment. Is that, is that a possibility? Absolutely, that's a fantastic use case of this, right? Is that not only can I reproduce it for myself, but I can hand that over to, to someone else and they can reproduce it in the exact same way. So I could take my entire networking team in my NetOps community within my company or my buddies or whatever and go like, I, I, I mean, I, I keep coming back to the 90s. I had Doug's disk of death. It was a 3.5 inch, 1.44 meg disk that had all the tools on it I needed to recover most PCs. I, could, I had a ghost image over here I could use to you know, load something in. It, like, it, it, was what I, it was my tool. And other guys at the company I was playing around with in college liked it too. I'm like, hey, here, take, you know, and we would share it around. That, this is the same thing nowadays. It's here's my tool, here's my toolbox. And here's, if you want to have my toolbox, take it. And if you want to take the program I wrote and re reproduce it in exactly the same environment, you can. And it gets rid of all of those, oh, well, I'm running on the Alienware 15 versus you're on a Mac that problem goes away. We're, we're in the same environment and my code's gonna 99% likely run the same way in the two environments. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's exactly what this can yeah. be used for. And it's That's probably- super one useful. Super, super useful. I mean, hats off to HashiCorp. They, they, they make such awesome tools. And Mitchell, <laughs> we love you. <laughs> uh, and this is definitely one of them. So, so highly, highly so, recommend. I'm gonna I'm gonna throw my um, audience challenge out. If if anybody like I have this super cool Arista Yeti, um, not gonna lie, this this thing is a lifesaver for. It actually does preserve my cup of iced coffee all day long, even though this is number five um, today. So if I forget about it, I'll check it at four in the afternoon. It still has ice in it, which is pretty cool. It's either a testament to the Yeti or my air conditioner. Um, but that being said, if somebody wants to get a four pack of these do one of two things. One, put a shell script up. Do a pull request up here and throw a shell script up for a Mac or a PC, don't care. That will install all of these components in one script I could run. Then we just get the setup done the way Fred's described it here and get everything installed and running with one script. That'd be super cool. Uh, want a four pack? Be the first person to post it. Uh, alternatively, if you wanna take the Vagrant VirtualBox model of that and say, here I've created an image that has all of this stuff pre-installed and here's the Vagrant file that if you wanna run this Vagrant file, it will install it onto your system so everybody can share in that tool. And we're all doing the same, we're all working off the same starting point. Again, happy to share a four pack of Arista labeled Yetis. Uh, they're, they're the 30 ounce Ramblers and they are very effective. <laughs> this is not a commercial interlude, but um, I'd be happy to share, you know, share those with anybody who wants to contribute and help out here. Um, post a couple of those things. It'd be really useful for the community. And I think a lot of people would benefit from it and um, get a four pack for your buddies and drink whatever your favorite beverage is through it. It does work for coffees. Back to you, Fred. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, nice, nice little, uh, nice little interview. There. Shameless plug. <laughs> yeah. So, so okay. So those were kind of the. I think those are like the core tools, right? Like those are those are some some really core stuff. Um, now I'm starting to get in some extra credit, right? So here's some stuff that is nice oh to have. Oh my Z shell, really? Oh my Z shell. Oh my Z shell. <laughs> oh my Corgi. I mean, yes, <laughs> gotta love it. Gotta love it. Um, yeah, so so here we're getting to kind of icing on the cake now. Um, you know, well, first off, sprinkles. Come on. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the cherry on top. So uh, so ZSH uh, Bash is fantastic, and I'm totally fine using Bash, and I'll use Bash, but you know, 50% of the time. You bash but, me all the time, Fred. Stop it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, bad dad joke. Um, 
cells. So, but ZSH is like pretty fancy bash, right? So you get, yeah. you get more things you can do. That's where this fancy looking prompt is coming from is uh, ZSH. It allows you just do, you know, fun colors, threw in things like GitHub status. You too could put emojis in your CLI. Emojis and all kinds of, you know, what version of, I mean, it's actually some useful information here, right? So I'm on the master branch and I'm on version 1.1 of this particular code. So it's it's giving me some, some useful information on, on there. Um, out of this box, ZSH just has some very vanilla stuff. Oh my ZSH now. <laughs> Wait for it, ladies and gentlemen, it's about it to get weird. All, yeah. <laughs> Gives you a whole slew of cool prompts that other users have defined in CSH and lets you just kind of import them and, and use them to your to your liking. So oh, that's great. Um, yeah, so it just gives you a nice way of browsing really cool prompt customizations that others have done and incorporate them into your own environment. That's awesome. Yeah. Can you yeah. incorporate like husky memes into your into your CLI? I, I you know I wouldn't be surprised if someone has. Awesome. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, now go. So we we harped on about Python and, and the madness of Python earlier. Um, go is for those who are maybe not familiar is a programming language created by Google. Uh, it is, I don't know. I, I guess I would categorize Safe it as C. <laughs> it, it's like halfway between C and Python, right? Like it's it's not as yeah, it's not as crazy as C as far as having to deal with memory allocations and shooting yourself in the foot. Or at least you, you prescriptively know when you're doing something in unsafe mode because literally the command is unsafe. Right, and and some great primitives for um, for multi-processing and multi-threading and, and all that concurrency basically. Uh, you know, you gotta think it's a modern language built by a very powerful uh, multi-threaded, multi-concurrent company. Uh, so they built these things into the languages is really nice. And really the guys easy. who originally wrote C. I mean, literally, yeah. they, they brought the guy who wrote C on to write Go. I mean, it's right. it's C without the sharp blade, right? Malik's right. heaps, stacks, management is all taken care of by default. Um, it, it's clean and easy to use. But what I like about it over, say, a Python is at the end of the day, you generate a static binary, right, versus so you compile the code as opposed to just yeah. running it as, as an interpreted script, uh, which gets rid of a lot of those dependency problems that we saw earlier. At the end of the day, if I end up with just a binary, I just run that binary on my system and I'm good to go. Yeah, literally uh, main.exe is a program that you run. And, and I, I'm gonna throw one thing out to like our, our networking audience friends. The, there's a lot of people who, when you say you're doing something in shell script, Python, I, I, I'm gonna kind of be a little blunt here. Some of us look down our noses when we hear you wrote a script for that. Oh, I have to run a script. Oh, it's, I mean, there's, I, personally, there's nothing wrong with the script. They, they make your life easy. But there's just something mentally, there's a bit flip. And oftentimes it's with people who don't know as much. They're like, oh, that's a script. Versus, oh, you wrote a program. Oh, that program is compiled. Yes. You know, run backupmynetwork.exe on my laptop. And it literally goes out and crawls the network and backs everything up. Somehow is magically deemed as better than backupmynetwork.bat, which did exactly the same darn thing. And I don't know why that is, but there is this mental perception. And so I, I think some of this just to consider is if you're starting off, if you have the opportunity to develop in a language like Go, where you can easily compile to a program and deliver that to your peer group, there's a set of your peers who will look at it and deem it a much more professional delivery if you're giving them a program that has been compiled into an executable. And I, I don't want necessarily want to say why that is, but it does seem to be that way. And if you're thinking of this from a professional development perspective, not to mention ease of use by other people who might be consuming your work, that compiled executable delivery and distribution does work well. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you a couple. I mean, I'll, I'll put on my CS hat for a second. Um, a couple of things that I, I, I particularly like about compiled code and some think particular things about Go. Um, first, by be, being compiled, it means you at least ran it through and made sure there were no egregious errors, right? The compiler will check you for doing anything just, just horribly, horribly wrong. Yeah. Input um, variable validation, check, right? right. Oh, SQL injection, we hope, check. <laughs> right, right, versus, versus an interpreted 
code like Python, you know, all those things will show up at runtime. When I when yeah. I run the when I run the script and, and interpret the script, that's when I will find those problems. Build time um, checks versus runtime checks. Exactly. So at least there's a level something checked you before you created that binary. It yeah. won't let you compile the code if you just did something really really wrong. Um, the second but, thing, but how, but how come nothing I ever write compiles then, Fred? I don't understand. What you're <laughs> no comment on that. <laughs> but but the other thing uh, with Go in particular, and again, this is putting on the CS hat for a minute. Uh, it it is uh, strongly typed, right? So yes. it also makes sure that you're using the right kinds of data in the right places. So if I'm trying to use, if I'm doing a say, boolean value back, I'm not writing it out as an integer. Exactly, or you know, a if true I'm false to, stays Boolean versus somehow magically it's true, unless I explicitly coerce that string to be otherwise, yeah. right? Um, and versus again with a say a Python, uh, you end up with these kind of errors all the time. Sometimes to your benefit, sometimes it gives you a level of flexibility that's nice. Uh, but I, I've had this with phone numbers when I was writing a program in Python and the problem was sometime in one, in one version of it, I was importing a phone number as a string and another, I was importing it as a number integer. Right. Right. And so I couldn't, it took me forever to figure out what the problem was because it was happening by default because of some other thing I did somewhere else. And it, it was a, a couple of days of annoying debugging. That, that's, that's a awesome point because I think those particular problems are just really can be really hard to pin down because yes. uh, they're just kind of murky and, and you, you really can't tell. Whereas again, with a statically typed language like Go, uh, you get that as a part of your compiler check. So those are two yeah. things I think have going for it. That, that program I wrote, Fred, as an example, 800 lines by the time I was done of Python because I had to do input validation and you know conversion of everything and, and just validating that the, the CSV or the XLS is, that we're inputting into it were, it would reformat them into a common data format versus if I had done it in a strongly typed language, it probably would have been about 100 lines of code. So literally 80%, 90% of my effort was on overcoming the fact that it was a loosely typed architecture. Yep, yep. So yeah, so I think those are two two strong benefits. Um, again, y you can argue the other way too. There's there's yeah. there's definitely benefits to the other side. Well, Python's uh, great for string handling. I mean, if what you're doing is primarily just string manipulation, it's a phenomenal language for that. Yeah, yeah. So was Perl. Yeah, but uh, uh, okay. Which is why as networking guys, we all started using Perl the Everybody first time we ever did anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> Everybody still has a soft spot in their heart oh, for yeah. Perl. Um, okay, so bat. This is a a replacement for the cat command that we talked about earlier, right? So, so you know, if you cat, there's a bad joke hiding in there. <laughs> <laughs> so if you cat a file, right? So I'm going to cat this devices.json file, right? We know what the, most people know what that does. It just takes the text file and spits it out to your screen. It echoes um, it to your screen, and that's it. Right. Bat does it, but it does it knowing more about what's going on. So it says, hey, hey, let me syntax highlight this for you and structure it in a way that makes sense for a JSON file and give you the line numbers for each one of them as well, right? And it can do this for code as well. So like if I bat Ooh, my, I like my if I bat my main.go code here, it's telling me, you know, it's again, syntax highlighting all the different things. It's like opening it up in, in a proper code editor, um, but just spitting it out on my command line. So, so bat is just a nice little tool that replaces cat for a lot of the kind of times when you're just trying to parse through some text files and see what's in there. And so you're doing something with buffer IOs, you're formatting your code and you're doing something with strings. That's all I caught out of that program. <laughs> <laughs> loaded up. Well, we'll show you this command, this, uh, this code in a sec, but uh, yeah. So, so bat is just a nice little tool. It's also written in one of my other current favorite languages, which is rust, rust. but uh, we, we're not going to go there. Um, all right, so, so that one's that. We're running out of time, so let me just nail Language out. of the year with Fred Chu, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> uh, yeah, so extra, extra don't give me stuff. Extra, extra stuff. This is, this is uh, these are Fred's science fair projects right now. Um, so a while back, Doug I'm gonna give you a gold star, okay? <laughs> <laughs> with the one you're showing right now that I did not know you were gonna pull the rabbit out of the hat, I am so glad you did this, thank you. But, Doug challenged me a while back to start messing around because we talked about all the virtuals of v VS Code, right? Uh, is to to make VS Code friendly environment for uh, EOS configs. So again, this is still a nascent project. I've st just 
kind of started wrapping my head around this thing. So what this is, uh, is exactly that. So I'm going to run, this has to run like a little dev environment. To is syntaxes a word? I, I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Either. <laughs> <laughs> I need to look at what is the plural of syntax? Yeah, it, it might just be syntax, but I don't syntax know. Maybe syntax. I, hmm. <laughs> <laughs> that would be a really bad Arista joke, ladies and gentlemen. If you be. don't get it, it's okay. <laughs> so, so here you can see that I've uh, started messing around with a VS Code extension for EOS that's doing syntax highlighting based on various components of what we know and love from a from an EOS command line. I can fold up the access lists, right? So these you are did access it. Lists. And see these fold up. So if I'm only trying to look at certain levels of code indentation, I can. I can fold these up and, and hide uh, these massive access lists that I could have. So we're getting there. Uh, work in progress, work in progress, but. Oh my dude, you did it. So we've been talking, okay, just to the audience, we, Fred and I've been talking about this for months because it just been like, I'm sorry, I get frustrated at this linear 1970s era text file monstrosity that we call network configuration. Um, I want to see us go to more item potent configs, uh, config nesting, object object oriented configuration models. There, there's so many things we can do better here, and this is a wonderful, wonderful start. And just check the CLI command before I hit enter. Let me know it works, right? It, like Fred's highlighting a no command so that you understand that that's going to remove something from there and it's color coding it that you can see. You know, I mean, can, can we add in um, automatically coloring IP addresses a different color or things like that, right? There, there's so many cool things that can be done in here that can streamline this. Or you could even imagine with the cool thing Fred was showing with JQ, right? Could we do have the moral equivalent of JQ for reading out the config and pulling a lot of the variables out? And I know some of this is incorporated the Jinja templating and Norner and tools like that as well. But I just think there, there's so much room to improve here. And it, it's so awesome to see this. So thank you, Fred. Hey, this yeah, is super yeah. cool. You've, I'm going to be kind of giddy for the rest of the week. <laughs> All that and my new gaming rig comes tomorrow. Well, yes. you know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you can see I highlighted the no, as you said, in red, yeah. deny in red. So, so some things uh, played around. It's, it's um, a great start. I mean, and, I mean can, you, can you just imagine like, and I, and I, I, know, I don't think this, this supports uh, you know, auto highlighting when you mouse over something, but you're taking an IP address or taking a domain name and doing a reverse or a forward DNS lookup when you mouse over it, or, I mean, again, even just collapsing ACLs, right, and seeing how many lines the ACL has before, you know, there's so many things we can do here um, that, that we can improve error handling, right, um, before we get to something, before we try to put it into a box. I mean, a simple one like DNS name validation, Right before you deploy something, very simple handlers that can improve a lot of this work. But this is so great. Yeah, and this is currently just on my repo. Anyone who wants to commit some code to it, feel free. I'm more than happy to to get some some other eyeballs on this. Um, so let, let me ask you this then. Yeah. Top two or three feature requests that you think would be neat with this baseline starting. Yeah, I think one that I, I really would love to see is um, see how we have this IP access list and IP access group here. Mm -hmm. um, much like you can do in, in regular code where if I'm calling a function later on, I can hit, I think it's like F4 or something, and it'll jump to the definition of that function, right? So I think it'd be super cool if I'm here on this particular access group, I hit that hotkey and it pops me down to the access list entry that that corresponds to. I think that would be super neat. Um, and then I That's think cool. some better, some better um, highlighting and syntax stuff. I mean, right now, you know, we've got some rudimentary things, but I'm, I'm sure there's a lot of work that can be done there. And that's relatively easy stuff. The, the highlighting stuff, you know, changing colors and stuff isn't too bad. Um, this little jumping around, I don't think it's too hard either. It's just someone needs to spend some time yeah. on it. Well, especially when, I mean, it, it's not obvious a problem when you have a 29 line config, when you're dealing with a 20,000 line configuration, it, it, it's far more obvious the value of that, of, of yeah. even, right? Just being able to go from 
one abstraction to an to the um, the widening of you know what is what does this abstraction mean? What is what is access list test in? What is access right. group access list test out? Yeah, I mean same thing for route maps and whatever else might be you might be doing where you're creating some kind of object and you want to refer to it somewhere else. Uh, being able to tie those together. The, the non-obvious nature of many of the QoS configurations we've all oh, had God. to endure. <laughs> God, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a great candidate. Yes. I didn't yes, even want to yeah, let's QoS the, here. <laughs> note QoS is not in here for a reason. It's a pain. <laughs> that's why. Yes, absolutely. That's uh, a rip, right. Fred. Thank you. Again, I'm yeah. gonna that that's my Twitter update for the day right there. You you asked me to promote this on social media, so I'm gonna promote that on social media. <laughs> That was awesome. I, I, I thought I'd save that as a surprise for you. Um, Thank you. I know we're at the top of the hour. One last one, another science fair project of mine is this EOS CMD. Uh, another thing that I think Doug and I have I've talked about in the past, which is where- uh, Lots of useless ideas and projects for other people I know, to implement. Right? But they're, right fun here, to, they're fun to play with, right? So what this, <laughs> what this does is it's gonna be a way, and it, it's, it's still very rudimentary at this point, but it's gonna be a way that, let's say I don't wanna go through all the trouble of learning Python or Go or whatever it is and all this automation stuff. I just want to automate things in bash, bash scripts, right? So we're going the, the other way on this. Uh, I should be able to just run this command in a shell, throw it a command that I wanna run on my EOS boxes and get the results back and do something with it. Just like I did, like I did with the JQ command earlier, right? I wanna just be able to get the, the structured data out of those EOS boxes without necessarily having to write a whole script in order to do that. Um, so that's what this EOS CMD does. It's going to, and right now I'm using, you know, environment variables to pass in my username and password. This is just on my lab. So yes, not, not secure at all. Um, but you know, environment variables to pass in my username and password. Uh, I'm also have this devices.json file that's in the directory that tells me the name of the switches that I'm gonna go hit. And then it's gonna run this command against every switch in this list, right? So this is just a way I can create a list of all the devices. I can run this command against every device and then it'll take all the output and stick it in this output directory. So you can see, you know, output of DMZ Leaf 11 show version is, is dumped out here. So if I wanted to do an inventory of all the devices I had on my list and get the versions out and then, for instance, dump all of that into a Google Doc, this is a pretty easy way to do that. There's a handful of but probably like six other commands I need to add to it, and the output could be an entire spreadsheet auto-populated of every device in its current version. If I wanted to connect that back and understand the software lifecycle management state of that, I could query it against the, for instance, if Arista, the Arista RSS feed, another vendor might be their EOX API. And what I could get from that is, uh, is this version GA maintenance release? Has it been deprecated? Is there a follow-on? That's the type of information I could then, again, using this framework, populate my data, pull external data, put it in there and know what devices I needed to upgrade right now because there's critical issues or I'm running on, you know, redacted code or you know, deprecated code that I should, you know, version that's not supported anymore, things like that. Right. Or, or you know, that, that early use case we had about backing up all my configs. Yeah. I could just do this through one CLI command and boom, get do show run on every box. And there you go. You got all your configs stored in a directory. No Ansible script required, no Python required. Just run a command and, and back it all up. Um, I think also what inspired this was someone asked for an easy way to get show tech from a bunch of switches and send that off to TAC, right? So I could run show tech here. It'll grab show tech from all those switches. You could zip up that directory and, and send it off to TAC. You know what I want now, Fred? I, I, I really, I, I think my, my fun project, and I'll probably like attempt to start it myself and then come beg you for help is I want the LLDP graph crawler, mm. right? Maybe. Like find all the devices then give me the inventory, then give me the back, you know, then back, then populate the version, then back it up, right? Because I think I, just one issue I keep hearing from people is this is great for the devices I know about. Yeah. <laughs> but too often somebody's turned something up. And, and by the way, even the, the, cannot, the, the list of here's a device we found that is not reachable with that username password, it might be under some other administrative control in our environment that I wasn't planning on as the network guy, but somebody slapped a switch in there. It's nice to know about that too. Yeah. Well, actually, I, what I would love to see with something like that is I've tried to make this thing friendly to our earlier comment about the piping, 
yes. to be able to receive pipes. So if we had the LLDP crawler, then could pipe to this thing. Yes. And then spit everything out again. Yeah, you know, I think there's there's a lot of cool composability we could we could incorporate there. Is this where we start dapping? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> That is super cool, man. I really, really dig that. Um, okay, I think Fred. We're way over on time. <laughs> we are way over on time. And you know, the sad part, and I'm gonna. This is all on me. We ex our, our initial goal was we're actually gonna do the installs of every one of these. I'm so glad we didn't because this would be a three hour webinar. <laughs> it would be insane. So I'm glad we actually just talked through them. All the links are available. All the URLs are available. All the information. You know, again. And, and not only is it available, it's available two ways, right? It's available from us to you, but also for you back to us. If there's tools that you think we should add here, add it to the Git page or shoot an email or Twitter to Fred or I. If there's tools that, if there's modifications you want to make, add them or, or give us ideas. We're always open. And if you want a free set of Yetis, because who doesn't? Um, whether you want to pack them with Tannerite, which some people do with their Yetis, which is really weird, or if you just want to drink an iced latte out of it, like I do multiple times a day, um, contribute. Okay, let's make this a team and community effort. There's no reason for this to be, you know, one way or one sided. This is an idea. And we would love input and feedback, whether you want to contribute to Fred's wickedly awesome VS code for EOS project, which is the coolest thing I've seen in a long time or just taking this installation and turning it into a Vagrant VirtualBox package, or turning it into a shell script that I can run on my Mac and I could install all of these in one command or one brew package. That would be so amazing to help this community of amazing network development professionals and, and make and grow that, that you want a four pack, drop it in, shoot me a note, doug at arista.com, let me know, I'll send them on over to you. Um, Thank you all. And I really appreciate the time, the feedback, the questions. And if there's anything we can do better, as always, please let us know. And I hope everybody has a wonderful next few weeks. And I'm sure we'll be back to you in August with something, hopefully building on top of what Fred did here, because I'm still floored that you actually did that. And thank you. Thank you, Fred. This is awesome. Oh, it's been great. And thanks, everybody, for attending. Okay. Cheers, everyone. Bye.